Yeah, we're going to briefly present the concept of the exhibition. Um, quickly show the exhibition, actually. I'm going to open the file folder with the photos. Um, and then I'm actually going to present the students individually, their backgrounds, and just a couple of images of their work. They'll go into that later in more detail. Yeah, it's always <laughs> it's the presentation image. Why? Dead baby's eyes. Okay, so we can just come back to that afterwards. Okay, I hope you've had a chance to uh, go upstairs and take a look at the exhibition. It's in one of the um, old Georgian rooms at um, the AA. And uh, it, it's a listed room. It's similar to this one here. And we were starting in a room that was very much uh, a standard white cube. They've put walls like this up in front, of, in front of the room. There's still a beautiful chandelier. But we thought, why don't we reclaim this room? We've been given this, this beautiful room, um, which is used as a standard exhibition space in a very Bauhaus sort of style. Why don't we reclaim the room as an old Georgian drawing room. You have the um, cafe next door. You have all these lovely sounds and, and smells coming from that room. And so what we decided to do was to use our exhibition, using that as an inspiration, and turn the room back into a salon. Um, turn the room back into an old, uh, you know, give it the life of, of, a, of a salon where people would meet, where they would come, where they would discuss, debate. Um, Bedford Square is actually um, the location of one of the oldest, um, uh, one of the most famous salons in London uh, that was started here in the 19th century and it's also um, obviously Bloomsbury Group is associated with it. And so that's what we wanted to do was bring this concept back. And the other reason we thought of turning, uh, using the exhibition as a salon was because we're all people from very different backgrounds. We're an original, a uh, very unique group within the AA in that we're not, half of us are not architects, half of us are. Um, uh, we have people coming from set design, product design, artists, curators, as well as half of the group being architects. So we thought salons in the, in the old days, you used to come there to meet with um, writers and, and uh, painters and politicians and philosophers and people would just come and, and meet together and that's why we came up with this concept of the, uh, the, the salon exhibition. This is the original presentation before anything actually went ahead. At the end we're going to show you the current list of events which are halfway through already. Um, truth springs from argument among friends. Um, one of the chief achievements, I think, of the AIS has been its prodigious production of argumentation. So we wanted to encapsulate that in exhibition, and the whole process encapsulated that quite well with Salon. Um, as Catherine just said, this is uh, what we wanted to do, stimulating conversation. There's been plenty of wine. Um, we've had a first of three conversations, a, w a really nice series of events that Catherine has organized, which sort of bring life to the salon, where people from outside the school come and talk about collaborative projects, which they've done. Um, and there's um, very nice canapes. There's two more next week, if you'd like to come. Um, the and the closing party which people will, be, will have uh, typewriters and people will be involved to uh, creatively become involved in the closing of our, uh, of our conversations and capture the last moment. Um, this was also meant to be a work in progress. So um, during the exhibition, uh, we were going to be documenting events that were happening in Yena, our performances, and also coming back here documenting the conversations. We've also got uh, a workshop by Emma Waltred Howes, uh, which Takaka was organized. And, um, a play which happened last night, which is the first, I think, for many years at the AA. Uh, we're documenting those, as well as any further production of work which members of the AAS are doing. So it's an updated exhibition, 
um, with people like Takako, um, who are specifically documenting what's happening as part of their project. Um, and showing all of the work that's happening uh, in Dessau and also in Jena. Um, this was the original kind of uh, framing for the, the salon. We just wanted to do a few things to make people feel when they walked into that room, which, as Catherine said, is normally white, very uh, plain, so that people can just show work, uh, architectural work, um, in the rotating exhibitions. We wanted to set it apart from those normal exhibitions by painting the room, uh, not a warm red, but a different color, which is kind of softer than the normal bare white. We carpeted the floor with a nice red um, and built a large central table. And a lot of the pictures are on frames or leaning off the wall to make it feel like a salon. Um, this has stayed pretty much the same apart from the red on the walls and the fact that the central table is now actually made up of several smaller tables so that um, when the play was happening and when we needed to have events that uh, required small tables for canapes for conversation, the large table could be ta taken apart. Um, should I show some more images as we, or you show them after? So this is the image that we used for the exhibition um, invitation. This is the uh, a drama group that used to exist here at the AA, and I believe that the image is from about 1927. And then you can see in the background we've added the pattern, the uh, pattern that Heather designed using the Bauhaus Lab logo. So it, th this is kind of the atmosphere that we were trying to um, to achieve with this exhibition. Oh, it's that's actually in the salon room itself. So I'll just show some images generally about the work without uh, going into detail. Adam will talk about everyone's individual work. Um, so this is the table that's sitting in the center. It's it's quite an amazing table that's been designed by um, by Kate. I think Adam and Paris do, uh, they, they did this and it's amazing because it can be reconfigured in many, many different ways and um, based on the pattern again, the, the Bauhaus pattern that uh, Heather made, um, you can see in the background there the, uh, the inflatable structure in Jena. Um, just a couple of more photos of the, the installation. The, um, as you can see, we, we changed the color of the room as well um, to give it a softness. That's Adam's piece there. The, um, the curtains were designed by Laura. We've had lots of compliments on them as well. I think you're taking orders, are you, Laura? <laughs> um, yeah, they have an amazing effect, yeah. Um, these are just a couple of images from the opening night. Um, there's a projection going on here with, um, with Heather's work, the, um, the, the pattern again which is being projected and had quite an amazing effect on the opening night as it was projected onto people's faces and it was really a very fun um, interactive sort of opening. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, and then just to let you know what's happening within the, the space, we really have worked hard to animate the space and to have lots of events. So um, as we mentioned already on the left side of this image, that's all that's happened this week. So we've had um, the drama, uh, the symposium, which is on right now. Oh, and then we have um, Emma's talk, which is actually next week. Um, we had our first um, discussion, part one, on the 19th, the collaborations, um, which was very successful. And uh, it's very much about conversations. It's not people sitting up front, sitting at a at a table, it's really a conversation. Everyone's standing around, sitting around. Uh, it feels very much like a salon. People are invited to interject at any point. People are invited to discuss things, bring up whatever they like. Um, I think it went on for a good two hours almost, that. Um, then next week we have, again, 
people who are working together on different collaborations coming from completely different fields. Um, and then on the 27th, we're going to be talking about failed collaborations. They were talking about it in a little bit more of a philosophical sense because I didn't particularly want to invite anyone whose collaboration had failed <laughs> because when they fail, they tend to fail spectacularly and people never want to see each other again. Um, so so we're, we're discussing more a little bit of the philosophy on that, on that day. So you're all invited to come. Uh, what's happening is that they're all happening in the room. We really wanted to have a room because down here, this really feels like a lecture hall. So we can only fit 40 people upstairs, but what we're doing is we're doing a video relay to downstairs because, of course, it's quite over oversubscribed. So um, that's about it. An interesting thing to address is as well that um, the kind of people coming uh, would usually never come just for a lecture at the end. Um, they would not come for a normal symposium often. Uh, I think that the, the venue itself, the Pub Salon, and this kind of whole setting, and the way it was at and, and mm. spoken about really triggered a different crowd. And as well, the people who come to look at it is as well a different crowd. And uh, I think that is, mm. for us, the, the, the key success of it, of, it um, of it being in that place, in that way, is the exhibition itself, on the one hand, and how it works and how it triggers people. Again, like the after effect that you discussed for the building uh, as well, um, that is what uh, was really important for us. And it's very important, I think, for all of us as well that um, that we all feel like equals in that room. We're all, you know, everyone has amazing ideas. No one's just an audience member. Um, everyone is invited. The, the guest speakers have all stayed around. Everyone's happy to chat to everyone, and it's very much um, a unifying kind of democratic, democratic sort of uh, situation rather than an audience and speaker sort of situation. So Adam is now going to talk about everyone's work, individual work in the, in the salon. In general, not only in the salon. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, this is our amazing ability to whittle down all of our individual projects into one. This is the most simple diagram we ever achieved, uh, talking about the AIS overall. So there's several thousand different themes going on. So I'll just kind of briefly present everyone and their background. And uh, not the title of their project, but kind of the theme. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Will is there and is an amazing artist. He does very colorful things and is interested in space. He's been working with inflatables before, so this was perfect for him. And he was quite involved in the whole process with the um, uh, AIS MTech collaboration. In fact, it was AIS Will and Teo collaboration. Um, he's also, at the same time as being uh, heavily involved in the inflatable structure project, he's been doing a project with Jan Brugermeier. Um, <laughs> called uh, Vorderplatzspieler, which sounds very German and fun, sort of. Um, which is to taking up the idea of games, play, interaction, how just having something incredibly simple like a marking on a floor um, combined with people's imaginations can um, uh, kind of promote them or provoke them to interact and be creative. And of course they, ha they did this in an environment originally just planned for the Jena Theatre Festival where people are ready to be creative, but um, they actually extended that and did it in two other places. They did it in Dessau and also in Bedford Square with foundation students here and with Will. Who was it in Des Dessau? Uh, just everyone, no? A lot of people joined in, didn't they? Yeah, so that, that was really successful. He's got some videos, I believe, of that later. Um, this is the uh, plan of the court. It's a kind of... Uh, Something which reminds you of a normal court, but it's uh, different, so um, people have to make up their own rules. Um, this is some of the rules that were made up, which are quite unusual, with the youth theatre group in uh, the Yenna Theatre Festival uh, uh, shouting each other from um, within predefined zones in this, which we couldn't quite understand, but they were being very interesting with the lines and their um, goggles. Parastu Anushepo, who is... Uh, not here. She's um, a set designer. F she just graduated from uh, St. Martin's. Uh, very talented. Um, this is one of her earlier projects. Um, uh, she did a set for Hamlet in a sort of strange underground uh, uh, giant shower room with no divisions. Um, and this year she's been kind of interested in this relationship between the body and uh, the actual 
uh, built fabric of the inflatable structure uh, along the lines of Lara's project you'll see later. And she's done a lot of different variations of this theme. There's people kind of inserting themselves into holes in the structure, so sort of male-female relationship, um, as well as sort of soft, glowing, attractive elements. So um, you were talking about the desire that uh, a building Im implies, sometimes wanting you to come towards it. Well, she was working quite well with the whole visual um, seduction aspect. Um, and then she got involved in Heiko's performance Bleak House, and she was actually asked to make a lot of the props. This is one of the props which she made, which was used, um, which one of the two actresses had to sit in for 45 minutes, not saying anything, um, which uh, I think she enjoyed actually quite a lot. I would enjoy to have this on. Um, Laura Boffi is a product designer who studied in Holland and has come to this course to, again, collaborate inter and interact with people from other professions. She's been interested in uh, the borders or the crossovers between the medical sciences and the world of product design or design in general and our everyday lives. And she's taken that forward um, s quite specifically in relation, again, like Parastu, to the inflatable structure and saying, okay, look, this inflatable structure has oxygen blowing through it. Um, and people are breathing out CO2. And if I insert a sort of, here we go, if I insert a sort of biological um, interface where, which transforms people's breath into oxygen, um, that would sort of create a really a unique uh, relationship between the structure and the people who occupy the structure. And this started off with her idea of empathy. She's really interested in the, the kind of recent discoveries of empathic neurons, I believe. Yeah. Um, that when people or monkeys see someone else doing something, um, it actually stimulates the same area of the brain which is stimulated if you're actually doing the thing. Um, and that's obviously inherent to the whole reason that we understand drama or have produced drama or have a relationship with objects because uh, we anamorph anamorphous it. Yeah, that kind of thing. We turn them into people. Uh, she actually built an interactive suit which did what she, what she said. Uh, and registered the amount of breaths which were breathed into this tube um, with little uh, descript descriptive cards explaining in German to people what to do. Um, uh, this is uh, the, the part of her project which uh, she put in the uh, salon to represent the project while it was going ahead in Jena. Um, she'll show you a picture later, I guess. Sorry, I didn't, didn't put a picture in. Great, okay. Funny, funny pictures of her attacking people with a <laughs> giant suit and taking their breath throughout Jena, through this little German town. Heather Lyons is, uh, wasn't happy. <laughs> <laughs> She's, uh, she was working for, uh, working in interface design, is that correct? For a quite a long time for mobile companies and also on websites, um, coming up with quite novel ways to uh, relate to databases. Um, she, before that, studied architecture um, and has now come to uh, this group and is working on uh, a kind of visual representation of the networking which we've done both between us as individuals and also between the different institutions involved around uh, Germany and, and uh, France and Hungary and London and all those places. And she's turned this um, in kind of using the material of the Bauhaus Labs logo which was uh, also brought into the design of the pavilion um, the sort of breakdown of a square with all connecting lines and used it to create uh, a grid which she's made as into an interactive field which um, relates to all the projects, also the tables. Um, and she's made a, a kind of a device now which allows you to turn this into a, a field of, of interaction between different points which spin at various speeds. She'll talk more about that later. This was it was probably the most successful thing on the opening night. As the light uh, as the light dimmed outside, um, we didn't need to turn the lights on because the projection was so strong, and everyone was sort of transfigured by these lines uh, on top of them. We have yet to try it with them spinning, but I'm sure it'll be quite fun and disorientating and spatial. Um, my name's Adam. Uh, I'm an architect. I just graduated. Um, and my, my project was taking up uh, this idea of uh, the black box and the white cubes and looking at uh, a way that passive architecture, people, always, people have been talking about before also about the pavilion architecture uh, performing um, in a sort of dynamic manner. And I'm, just, I'm quite interested in the idea of architecture or architects re reappropriating the idea of architecture performing in a passive manner um, and not really using the terminology or the ways of defining performance from other professions, but internally to uh, kind of reignite what 
the uh, the set context of architecture can provide to an event. And this was done through several things. It was done through exclusion, so architecture that excludes activity and is totally afunctional. Architecture which disturbs performance and disrupts production, so it problematizes a setting. Architecture which visually stimulates and disorientates the viewer through color, reflection, pattern. Um, those things were taken up. Um, th there's, a, there's a series of drawings um, uh, which kind of culminated in uh, uh, one of which is in the exhibition upstairs. Um, called performative space. Um, I also came up with a series of looking at the same time as what this passive architecture envelope might do, what the interior of what happens in relation to that passive architecture, because it's kind of quite a subtle relationship between the type of uh, inter-performative uh, events which happen between the audience and the architecture, and I, I made a series of characters which were quite sensitized to those sorts of situations and made a series of films which um, were shown in one of which was shown in Dessau and, and the others which were shown also in um, Jena and used in Bleak House as well with Parastu's hat. Um, this was a projection of one of the films which was uh, used also in the Jena Theatre Festival. And on the, uh, the uh, white waffle turned into drive-in cinema. Catherine, would you like to talk about yourself? No, okay, Kath <laughs> Catherine... Um, <laughs> Uh, is a, ha was a curator, curator and curated an uh, incredible series of exhibitions across the whole year in uh, 2005 called Man in the Holocene. It involved pretty much everyone uh, of the who's who in the art scene in London, I believe also beyond, including this really <laughs> quite unbelievably performative in every respect um, piece by Doug Fishbone, which uh, I, I believe Catherine coordinated, where they, they brought out very early in the morning uh, 30,000 bananas, which um, disappeared by the end of the day. People picked them up um, and uh, was really noticed a lot by the media. Um, she's currently doing a project um, called 100%. What is the title of the project? 100% audience. Um, where she's inverting this idea of um, who are the performers and who are the spectators. And she set up a fictional scenario where um, she imagined uh, that the actual space of the theatre house in Jena gets filled up with a monstrous architectural blob which pushes everybody else out. An initial starting point sort of related to my idea of problematizing architecture. But her, with hers, sort of the, the lighting uh, the lighting designers, the um, the scenographers, the actors, the directors kind of run out screaming into the city, but they need to continue their job. There's this festival, you know, they have to put on all these performances. So suddenly you find these uh, situations where in, in the barber house, the, uh, the barber is actually the director, and he's turning the people who are having their hair cut into a scene from a play, which is then continued by the person directing traffic on the street, who is, uh, I don't know, the lighting designer, and who is just turning the street lights into a choreographed display, um, which, which stops people at just the right moment in turns it into a kind of fun performance like in, um, yeah, I mean you get the point. This is, and she made a, a, an incredible series of photographs in London where the situation of everyday life were turned into uh, questionable scenarios of are they performances, are these actually uh, equivalent to sitcoms and dramas. Um, this is one of them. She made uh, a couple of others and also a film, which was also projected onto the pavilion uh, in Jena. Uh, and a series of photographs which um, take moments from na the narrative which is kind of elaborated and explored of, of situations within that scenario. This one is called Magnus 2009. Kate McTiernan is an architect from Perth who studied at Melbourne <laughs> <laughs> University. And uh, here we go, Melbourne. She's kind of quite inspired by uh, the way public space can uh, uh, bring people together and also by loaded objects. Uh, which retain memories and which people kind of connect to uh, the more insubstantial aspects of uh, objecthood through. This is a house that she designed while working for practice. That she likes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that she, she worked on um, in Australia. Um, and she's also a furniture designer, um, which is why she was in charge of the table design and also the plinths for the salon exhibition. Um, for the uh, Dessau uh, exhibition, Kate designed uh, a series of kind of furniture pieces which would be able to accumulate uh, objects which had uh, 
particular relevance for individuals. And I think she went around, she was collecting those for quite a period before the exhibition so that the piece that was made was ready to kind of be a receptacle for them. Um, and she also, uh, and so she acquired sort of ready-made bits of pieces of furniture which imply a sort of daily personal use and asked people in the Dessau, uh, in the Bauhaus in Dessau, to go to different places in the actual building and put together their own unusual combinations using these everyday bits of furniture, which I believe are from Ikea. Um, and then those were joined together into sort of one extremely large, strange installation with uh, where these pieces had been put together in the Bauhaus written on them. So for instance, one would say made in the gravel pit. One said made underneath digger, um, made on balcony. And then, so these already started to accumulate relevance from where they had been put together in the Bauhaus, accumulating memories and also personalities because they were all built quite differently. And then they received different objects which she had been accumulating from also, I think, all over Germany. Yeah, you know. And so they kind of, they were put all around it into these drawers so you could discover them. Um, <coughs> ah, of course. And, as well, there were st <laughs> stories relating to each of them, um, which people picked up and read while looking through, so uh, objects at rest which were included. Um, this is uh, a fragment. It actually extends in every direction <laughs> outside of it. But you can see um, here lenses and lights and objects just all over the place, but a lot of lenses. Just to quickly mention, Zeiss is an imp one of the world's most important produ producer of lenses, and they're based in, uh, in Jena. Takako is was trained as an architect at the AA um, but even while at the AA was already doing quite subtle and delicate artistic installations um, this kind of subtlety is what she's taken forward in her two projects one one is a, p a kind of collaborative performance with Emma Waltrad House which you'll see later she's doing a presentation on it in um, in Jena in the square in front of Jena also using Will's Vorplatzspieler as a sort of diagrammatic framework um, but for the rest of the year, she's been chronicling everybody in the AAS and our interaction through uh, photography of our hands um, and the way that we express ourselves and depending on what mood we're in, the way we express ourselves. Um, this was kind of collated into a sort of barcode, continuous barcode depend with different intensities depending on the moment. Uh, which was used to kind of tie the exhibition together. We don't really have explanations in different parts of the exhibition. We have instead um, uh, the sort of narration which Takako has provided underneath all of the works where, um, where, for instance, underneath here you see this is the bottom of Will's work. Where Will's is, there's a sort of concentration of things relating to him. So you see kind of more the emotional impact of the way we worked rather than a clear narrative description. Um, yeah, and that, that was very successful, and I'm very grateful because it tied the exhibition together really nicely in a kind of delicate manner. Um, oh, yeah, instead of name tags, she just put hands, <laughs> uh, of which Heather's, I think, are the most brilliant. <laughs> um, thank you. to have to sort of change this over. Um. Okay, um, sorry, Adam's already uh, given a brief explanation of the work that I'm doing, uh, but my project basically started with this drawing by Oscar Schlemmer, because as you know, there's obviously been a huge tie-in with the Bauhaus and our work, um, and I was really interested in the way he 
sort of abstracted movement in theater and was interested in mechanization and, and made pieces that were, or choreographed pieces that were about um, the, um, the mechanization of movement and, and, and sort of distilling movement down into very discrete steps. Um, and th this was a drawing he did sort of along these themes where he diagrammed out all the possible movements, these sort of mechanized movements within a cube. Um, and this drawing became the basis for the uh, logo that the Bauhaus Lab is using. And basically what they've done, and Adam showed this drawing already, is taken an axonometric of a cube and flattened it. So each one of these hexagons is actually the axonometric of a cube. And I used this drawing to generate a grid, basically, so a new sort of um, geometric system. Uh, and this geometric system, uh, you know, because we were all sort of coming from different backgrounds, the idea was to create um, a visual language that people in the group could sort of borrow from, this, this, this grid, this sort of geometric structure. So you could read all sorts of forms into it. Um, I played with sort of using it as the basis for a font uh, and many other things. And um, we used it in the, for example, in the invitation to the salon. So it became a bit of an identity for us. Uh, Catherine created a games table, and she used the, this uh, diagram as the genesis or the, uh, or the underlying idea behind this game where people sort of took these triangular shapes and tried to make different forms out of them. Uh, the, the, this sort of triangular network that, that came from the grid is also used to help generate some of the forms for the tables. Uh, so, so again, it created an underlying network that everyone could kind of uh, borrow from in a language that would help sort of tie all those work together. Um, this is, <laughs> so, so the, the piece I created is called Movement in a Cube, and, um, and what it is is it's, it's, a, it's interactive wallpaper, essentially. Um, I, I, with the help of a programmer named Matt Jacob, we built it in a uh, environment called processing, which is modified JavaScripting for anyone who's interested. Um, and basically, it, it's, it's an animated uh, pattern, um, and the idea was to hook it up to a series of mixers so that you can alter uh, the formation of it. So what we've done is we've hooked up one knob to it that will affect the number of lines that are generated at any one time, so you can turn it from zero up to 8,000 lines that, are, that appear in the grid at any one time. So there's the knob. Um, <laughs> there's another sort of image of the grid going. Um, and then I'm just going to actually run the application so that you can see what I'm talking about. Um. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know, it's a little geeky, this presentation. It's cool. <laughs> yeah. it's so as the, um, as the script runs, this uh, grid begins to generate, takes a little time, and, is, and the way it's scripted now is that as soon as a hexagon uh, is generated, uh, the script generates another hexagon on top of it and they start to spin. And so what I've done with the knob is uh, you can turn it up or down so that the lines will start, so you can turn the lines down to literally zero so all the hexagons will disappear, or you can turn it way up so that um, it's the whole wall is literally covered with a field of hexagons. Um, and the idea was originally, although um, uh, we sort of kept it simple uh, for the purposes of the exhibition, was to, to create a whole mixer for this pattern so that you could, cause there's a, because it's code, there's a whole number of variables inherent in this pattern. So, for example, right now we've set it up so that there's a, there's a 30 column grid, so there's 30 hexagons along, so, you know, Perhaps I could add a knob so that it, you can turn it from 10 to 50 or something and, and, and start to really dynamically play with the scaling of the hexagons and the speed that they're spinning at. Um, and, and I'd like to do a little bit more research into Schlemmer's ideas about movement and light uh, and, and, and really start to, to continue to work with this idea. Um, so, I, you know, that's, that's it pretty much in a nutshell. Um, I was just gonna, yeah, so here, for example, hey. um, so this line of code is, is what I'm using now to input, uh, you know, the different variables to generate the different numbers of lines that are generated in the grid. Um, yeah. 
Okay, skal vi vente. Tanya said, okay, they have enough to do. We can't organize a third exhibition to be opening at the same time. So let's just figure out something while we're, while we're there. We'll prepare some ideas beforehand, but actually just do it while we're there. And it was an amazing experience because the first day was almost done pretty much just testing things and seeing where we'd go. And the second day was putting on making the, um, the works for the exhibition. And I thought it worked incredibly well considering that we did this in a very short amount of time. And, um, and Torsten, he, he gave us all inspirations and came around and said, okay, this might be a good thing to put in. And, um, and it was, yeah, we used, <laughs> yeah, Kate had sent some things in advance to, to, the Des, uh, to Dessau, but otherwise all the, the materials were found on the on site. And um, yeah, did we have a title for the exhibition? Interspace, that's it. Uh, <laughs> um, but it was really an exhibition, I think, about um, play and playfulness and about in interaction. There were, and I guess we'll t show that now. This is the video that we um, made of us putting together. Oh. That was that was the second day. The first day was actually beautiful. Um, so these are just a couple of images from the Bauhaus. For those of you who don't know what the Bauhaus is now, it was the Bauhaus School, 
um, and now it's been turned into a foundation, but there are still students coming from all over the world. Um, some of them interacted with us and, and worked on Kate's piece, some of the st local students who were there. Um, you can go, you can stay here, although I hear you get very noisy neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, after after it was a school, after the war. Um, so that's that's what it just some images. Um, this is this is something about the work that I did there, which um, Tanya very kindly helped me with. I had absolutely no clue what I was going to do <laughs> when I came to the when I came to um, Dessau, and. Ms. Torsten and I had a conversation about some of my work here, and I have created a games table, which is in the, the salon upstairs to kind of um, go back to the old days, how they used to have games tables or a card table, and so I had made one of those. And Torsten and I had a discussion about it, and he asked me to recreate a Bauhaus-style um, games table. So Tanya and I worked on creating, um, it was a, a series of three games of varying difficulties. So, um, whoop, don't touch the cable. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry about the color. Um, so these are just a couple of images of what the games table looked like. So again, using the, um, the design that um, Heather had picked up on, on, on the left, and just a very plain, simple um, design. And how, how the game works is, um, these are just some more images. How the game works is that um, um, two people sit on either side of this white. Is it? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I think we're losing it a little bit here. So bear with me. Um, two people sit on the di on either side of this dividing line, and um, they both have the same number of pieces on either side, and uh, one person makes a pattern on their side. You can't see onto the other side of the table. And they have to explain to the person on the other side of the table how to make exactly the same pattern. Um, and uh, so it's really a game about communication, conversation, and, and collaboration, or failed collaboration. Um, <laughs> there was a bit of shouting going on here. <laughs> And um, yeah, so that, that, that was up. I believe our exhibition was on for about, how long was it on for about 10 days or two? Yeah, so it was on for about, uh, and people were invited to come and, and play the game. And as we were making it, there was um, people touring through the Bauhaus constantly and um, kind of uh, in awe that there was actually people working there creating these kind of things that were so fantastical. And I have somehow managed to step on this. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, this is Kate's piece. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I brought with me from Jena um, some little uh, huge props, um, some lenses that Carl Zeiss company sent me, an enormous box of lenses for free. Um, and uh, I also yarn ordered a bed from Ike Ikea and 15 storage boxes. And so we piled this all into the van um, and drove to Dessau with it. And I, again, um, I, had a, I had kind of a set idea about making a, um, a storage container out of uh, reappropriated Ikea furniture, um, kind of linking to the, um, how we enclose our memory within these kind of uh, very structured wooden um, very simple um, containers and more often than not these days everyone has IKEA drawers in their house and the idea of um, IKEA is in some ways the realisation of the Bauhaus principle in terms of um, it made design accessible to a lot of people at a, um, at a cheap price and um, so I wanted, to, I wanted to play with doing something with IKEA at the Bauhaus but kind of giving back to, um, to IKEA and that kind of design mentality um, some of the intimacy and um, and meaning of a place. Uh, do you think it's a, um, 
So IKEA, you can even buy kind of virtual life IKEA sets for your Sims games, and um, they have no connection to place anymore. Um, so I wanted to bring it back to Bauhaus and give it um, a sense of place and elevate the act of assemblage um, as an individual pursuit rather than just following the instructions. So everyone was given one of the 15 boxes and they all went and found a corner of the Bauhaus uh, set of stairs. This, what, this is a Bauhaus student she was working on um, and there's a lot of different ones. And you had to construct your box without the instructions um, on that uh, site and it had to take on, it, it uh, eventually kind of took on the form of the site or the feeling or the aesthetic of the site. Um, so this one directly kind of took on the form, it became very stepped. Uh, and then Paris Dude did it on a pile of concrete <laughs> <laughs> and that one was covered in kind of um, dirt and bits of scrap concrete and um, then the uh, MPEG boys did it on the sand pit. <laughs> 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 they actually got quite frustrated because the at the start we didn't have any, it was a bank holiday, we didn't have any um, construction, we didn't have hammers and brooms and things. So for about an hour before, they were using rocks from the sand pit <laughs> to um, bang the thing together. <laughs> um, Laura very interestingly chose a tractor <laughs> and um, it took on the form of the tray of the tractor that scooped up the earth. Uh, I chose the balcony and my structure kind of it really felt kind of represented the Bauhaus. It had a similar um, look to it. So that's flowers. And then we wrote on them um, where they were made, kind of a play on the made in Korea, made in China thing, tag you see on everything, but so specific and um, and playful rather than um, just lazy. And then uh, we collaborated in putting them all together with the um, original instructions how to make each box at the top. And um, place all um, the objects I'd collected with the story um, inside the spaces, the floor like spaces, um, for people to um, pick out and invite people to also um, to place any uh, souvenirs they had of their own experience in the Bauhaus within the structure. Um, I don't know if that, does anyone, does anyone, did you accumulate your objects? The idea was that the, it didn't. This is this is Paris Jews. She, uh, you saw at the beginning of the uh, the film, there were um, uh, fans that were that were blowing, <coughs> and um, and and she really just found amazing found objects all around the Bauhaus and brought them back, and created this semi sculpture, semi um, semi uh, dancers. Um, which were related back to the Bauhaus Ballet Mécanique, which had been performed, I believe, on the same stage. So you actually had these these almost like dancers that were that were um, uh, in the form of fans that were blowing and and uh, speaking to each other and, and dancing. And uh, these were like uh, costumes, and it was it was really quite beautiful. Um, this is uh, Will's. Um, the Vorplatzspieler, I won't discuss this much because he's going to be doing a presentation on it, but this was the outside one which he made. Um, this is the indoor one that he made. I think he's become quite an expert at making these now, so if you want a Vorplatzspieler, please speak to Will. <laughs> um, and um, in this one, it was really quite fun because um, Torsten became almost a bit of a choreographer and he gave four of us, he gave us um, actions to do. So four of us had different actions and um, 
I don't, I, ca I can't even remember exactly how it worked. We kind of got on the stage and we all started to dance in the way that the ba ballet mechanique, um, the dancers had done, which was very mechanized. We, we just walked on the lines and somehow we, we were all dancing to the beat of our own drum, but somehow it all came together and, um, and really did look like a ballet. But I'll leave it to Will to, um, to talk about that more. The colors are really wrong. <laughs> um, it w upstairs, you can see Adam's work. Um, he very kindly was um, the person who put together um, everyone's work, as well as working on Kate's work. He um, did the did the poster for this exhibition, which was put around through throughout the um, throughout the Bauhaus, inviting people to come to the exhibition. I think that's it. And now. It was projected onto the. It was projected onto the ceiling. Um, it's a. It's a piece that uh, uh, Adam, Catherine, and I are talking about. Um, uh, times when we've been in a theatrical performance, but been quite formal, and been more interested in the informal perform performances going on around us and interacting between people, and the um, overwhelming sense of the architectural space rather than the actual overlap we're telling we're telling each story and we're overlapping and then at one point um, the thing we're saying becomes the only uh, the only spoken you can only hear one person speak and you capture um, just like when you're in a theater and you're hearing hundreds of people's conversation you capture um, a, dis a segment of what they're talking about so you can only just make out what um, what feelings we have what it was very much about people um, going into a theatre and not just watching what's happening on stage, but watching all the people around them who themselves become actors and who themselves become the audience. So the piece was called People Watching People Watching Architecture, <laughs> which I think in, in um, Yenna was changed to People Watching People. Chicago's now going to talk about her her piece at um, Bauhaus Dessau. <coughs> so we should now like just discuss what we have seen. Um, but then, um, ah yeah, you know, just like for you. Right? <laughs> but uh, we, we, after this, we are gonna uh, make a lunch break and continue with the, uh, the rest of the inner performance. Tarko is going to show her installation of the bounce, which is like a, a surrounding one, which leads on very nicely into the afternoon presentation. I'll, I'll drink one next. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the language. 
first one to pop it. Should be the next one, right? bit higher for me, kind of lower for me. Um, I also arrived at DESO without knowing what's going to happen <laughs> at all. Um, and so um, Mr. Bloomer uh, briefed us uh, what would be nice to continue somehow, continue our journey uh, through from the salon and all these exper uh, experiences. And then uh, as I was documenting the whole AARS, almost obsessively <laughs> <laughs> documenting all the photographs and then kind of making stories out of all these photographs into uh, strips of narrative, um, on its own narrative uh, visual visualization. And also I was taking, um, immediately took notice that the people who are visually oriented have lots of hand motions like I am doing now. And uh, that was very, very characteristic of each individual person and really, really talks about um, what they are seeing in their heads, what they are seeing in, my mi in their mind. So I started to document the hands especially. And then in, in the salon, uh, one of the pieces that I made was to uh, create these hands as their name, as they are kind of replacing the name tags so that they really talk about uh, um, the inner self of the, the work itself. So uh, Mr. Bloomer uh, advised me to continue with this hand thing and then and then I was, I arrived a day late, we arrived day late uh, to, to this all Eight hours late, because <laughs> we missed the train. <laughs> and then I had to make five seconds decision what to do. And I saw uh, everybody working on these uh, IKEA pieces, which I stealed <laughs> uh, these pieces, which were about um, 50 or hundreds of them avail available. So, um, and then, it kind of turned into two small projects there. Um, so navigating through Bauhaus and then they turn into Bauhaus performance for hands. And then, so Bauhaus, uh, I populated the Bauhaus building itself uh, with this, wherever available. And uh, so starting, you can see the small object, this one just in front of the red door and um, close up and I positioned them as you go in and then you per first notice this and then the next one will be somehow in your vision. So you have the continuity in your vision so that somehow it's kind of subliminally <laughs> in your head to follow uh, the entire um, uh, whole three floors of Bauhaus building. And one of the staff at the Bauhaus was actually annoyed and she asked me to get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I was actually pleased to hear that because it started to affect the feel of space and the sense of space, which actually in my first year in AA, uh, back in 1995, one of the first learning what the AA was that tiny little object has such a power to transform the space. And I somehow re re recurring this theme, um, how many years later? <laughs> and that was, <laughs> that was really nice. So uh, as you can see, I positioned them all over the building. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think this was also, it was actually this way up, of course, as a drawer but because just simply turning up uh, upside down, this became a kind of icon or genera general um, image of domestic scale or icon or mouse hole or bridge that um, somehow it was easy to handle it. It was easy for, I think, the people to 
associate with as well. Um, I really, really positioned everywhere. <laughs> it, it's kind of a tour through the Bauhaus building. So I think I was one of the people who had a uh, great opportunity to explore the building itself because I wasn't uh, um, in the theater space, whether I was outside just walking up and down maybe 50 times going through the whole building. That's really fantastic. <laughs> This, this was a spontaneous, again, two seconds decision to use this again on the stage, just to use uh, uh, Will's game board as well. And then the next step for me was to ask Laura uh, to, she was a hand performer for me, and uh, sm uh, also Will for, for some, some positions. My idea eventually became that these are the somehow a sign for somewhere to look for the elements of the building so that the, these sites became the site or the stage of the hands to, to perform. So I asked Laura to imagine these spaces or objects or the elements as uh, the, her hand stage so that the hands will react, hands will occupy, hands will um, interpret uh, and also the hands can make sound, hounds can make noise, uh, I mean the same, I mean the <laughs> movement. Um, so it's not only positioning, but somehow the um, living the, the, the elements of Bauhaus. So um, I, Laura was really, really patient with me that I had to take like more than 100 positions with her. <laughs> always performing, but I also enjoy that the, um, through to the half uh, or ten or so, she started to think first to how to occupy the elements with her hands, and then these are some um, my favorites, and the I didn't. Um, put the sites these ones. But um, eventually, I don't know whether it's a good thing or not, but uh, my initial idea was to take these photographs and then uh, take a photograph and stick it on here so that these are not totally uh, next to the elements, but people would see and then imagine the use of the empty um, elements so that they can connect. So my next task for the Desho still continues to um, keep working on this and then bring back to Desho, hopefully. Thank you. <laughs>